Can this pistol fit into the palm of my hand? Hmm. Kind of. Not quite. It's still very compact. The Springfield 911 in 380 chambering. That's right. I'm reviewing a 380. Hey, nothing fancy. We thought you hated the 380. Uh, interesting observation, sir. <laughs> but not entirely correct. I wouldn't say I hate the 380. I just recommend guys carry a subcompact 9mm for more effectiveness. They're dang near the same size. They hit harder. Why not carry a 9? That's what I've said. I don't hate the 380. And sometimes I really like it depending on the platform, the bullet launching platform. And now we will consider the Springfield 911, nothing fancy style, tabletop review. Multiple outings taken with this gun, the Springfield 911. I did see it come out a while back. I was really debating reviewing it. And something that did sway me into the review were you guys. I did see a couple comments, yes. I always see comments on a lot of different guns to review. But more importantly, I ran into guys through the years carrying either a P238 or a P938 SIG variety. Meaning there's a lot of dudes that do carry single action subcompact pistols frequently. I've seen about 30 through the years. It's popular. Lately I've seen more 938s than 238s. It seems to me like the 238 has kind of waned for sales. Although I do talk to Gunny's, the great American gun store. Let me get my radical sign here. To thank them for the loaner pistol checked out to me for this review. No money being exchanged hands. Unless I buy it, and then I pay him. Gunnies, there it is, Orem, Utah. Talking to Wyatt, the store owner, and some of their clerks, I go, hey, how are those, you know, 238 selling? And they said, well, they have slowed down. I mean, they're not like a hot seller, but they're they're still selling. And the 380s as a whole, they still sell. So it's not like they have flatlined for sales, says Gunnies. And they're a really big gun store, I think. And so it's a good data point, not the end all data point. I said, well, who's mostly buying them, these 380s? And generally, it is women. He, he says that it's either a husband buying it for the wife for concealed carry, or the woman comes in for herself, looks at a lot of different options to include 9mm, and they just like the 380s. They like how they're more slender, they're smaller, and... Like my wife, Mrs. Nothing Fancy, she loves a tiny little gun. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. Uh, I try to force her to carry her Glock 43, which she does nowadays, but uh, I don't know. It's our own personal battle. She usually likes carrying like a P32, the LCP2, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Oh yeah, thanks to also Federal Premium for some boxing of ammunition via gunnies. So it's through gunnies. I get some boxes, not cases. I wish it was cases. The rest I buy. So it's a very limited partial sponsorship. It always has been. Uh, we still spend a lot of money on ammunition. Tabletop players, before I kick off uh, to the standard stuff, we'll talk a little bit about philosophy of use. Uh, definitely features, how did it shoot and would I buy a Springfield 911? This is a very cool coloration of an RF4 Phantom Luftwaffe. And it was for a certain meet, I think, in the 1980s in uh, Germany, I think. So NATO, it was a NATO fighter meet, and they painted this RF4 just for the meet. How cool is that? So cool. Tiger stripe. Look at the detail. And the brand on this plane, it's 172nd scale metal. It's Air Power Series is what this is. From the Nothing Fancy Aviation Museum. As I drop the stand. I love the R RF4. Uh, you guys want to hear a quick story about the RF4 before I go into the uh, gun review? Okay, Air Force story time. Yeah, a guys like this. I don't know why I'm going to tell you the story now. Well, I'll get to the gun. If you're in a hurry, just, uh, I don't know, slide it over to the right, bro. So I'm flying T-38s up at Minot, North Dakota. Uh, T-38 was a supersonic trainer. I've shown you pictures, a lot of it. Uh, I'm retired, 21-year Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Air Force. So at the time I was flying T-38s, I'm going out cross country with my friend Jeff Waters. We're sitting there mission planning and we're in the old Minot Air Force Base alert facility that had these plate glass windows. Uh, and this has to do something with RF-4. 
Uh, big plate glass windows are facing the runway and it used to be the alert facility where the F-106s, the Delta Darts, used to stay on alert to intercept Russian bombers coming over to bomb the U.S. during the Cold War. That's what we were expecting and we prepared, prepared accordingly. As we're mission planning, it's like a Friday afternoon, close of business, like 4 p.m. We're getting ready to launch out on our T-38 and fly all the way to California. Here comes a pair of U.S. Air Force RF-4s. They're in tight wingtip formation and they come over at about 300 feet off the runway doing about 500 knots. This plane right here is like almost the speed of sound just under. Now, you got to know it was an air show weekend for the base. So all airspeed, airspeed and altitude restrictions had been waived. Muddy and I, that was his nickname, Jeff Waters. Muddy Waters, get it? So Muddy and I see this. We're like, dude, check that out. And the RF-4s pull up in formation vertically in full afterburner, full afterburner. And we're like, oh my gosh, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. I mean, these guys were old Vietnam era pilots, probably coming to the end of their career. I forgot what base they were from, maybe Boise A&G. I don't really remember. I think Boise had RFs. And then we go back, we're just like talking and here comes a T-38 crew doing the same thing from Minot. I'm not going to give any names even now. I don't know if enough time has passed. And they go, same thing, 300 feet off the deck, trying to match what the RF-4s had done, shredding above the runway. And Jeff and I are sitting there watching this. We're like, what? Because that is forbidden for us to do that. You need a special air show qualification to fly like that. And my, I was a co-pilot in the KC-135 flying T-38 Ace at the time. That's a great way to get in trouble, perhaps even lose your wings because it's considered dangerous and careless. Now the R4 crew, they're not part of my command, who knows what their, their rules and regulations are, but for a T-38 co-pilot crew, there is no way that was approved. So here he comes, not 500 knots, he's probably doing about 400, maxed out, full burner. He comes over and does an unrestricted climb to 20,000 feet, a T-38. Oh my gosh, Jeff and I were like, oh my gosh, someone's career is getting ready to end and we're seeing it firsthand. And our ace chief comes storming out of the door and he thought he saw a glimpse of the T-38 and he's like, hey, was that one of our planes? And there was a super cool T-38 IP who instructed us, his name was Kurt, and he totally covered for this guy. I'll give you his first name, he covered for Mark. He's like, nah, that was the RF-4s. And the ace chief who was the boss of our T-38 unit who could have really burned this guy, went back in his office and he never got in trouble. So the end of the story is, so Mark and his buddy had gone out on a cross country on the T-38s, right? They come back the, the Sunday night and guess who met him in the uh, office? Kurt, the IP, and he dressed them down. He chewed on them for like an hour about how careless and stupid they were, about how he covered for them and they could have both lost their wings. And they exited that office with their tail between their legs trying to impress the field on air show weekend, actually trying to compete against this plane, the RF-4. End of Air Force story. God, France, you need to tell more Air Force stories. We love them. I will, I will, that's just one. I don't know if I told that specific story in my Air Force stories history, I don't know. Uh, and for me, like when I flew the 38, it was awesome. I mean, it's supersonic and I was an aggressive pilot, but at the same time, you have to operate within what is considered smart <laughs> okay you don't want to put your wings on the line like for instance if you were to take a t-38 and you flew into let's say somewhere in northern california and you just get a whim go let's go fly under the golden gate bridge let's go fly under the oakland bridge something by the way they used to do with t-33s i don't think 38s ever did it definitely t-6 texans did it and then the locals in northern california got sick of it and they started burning guys doing it but if you were to do it now you're done. And in fact, you're not just going to lose your wings. You're probably going to go to Leavenworth. Yeah, we've lost our sense of humor in the military. There's uh, no leeway anymore. How about the Springfield 911? Does that make me happy? Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to how to shoot. First features. Um, it's a very compact gun. I let off with that for sure. 14 ounces. A Caltech PF9 is around 13 ounces. So again, there are super compact, super lightweight 9mm's. The same form factor. 
the retail actually i can't remember the store price i think it's around i can't remember if it's retail or store price 530 i have written down here on my notes and the features we have reverse chevron on the slide million i'm talking about none on the front you don't need it for such a short pistol browning tilt barrel design just like the p238 loaded chamber indicator external extractor matte chrome finish on this particular version let's look at the sights nice sights uh you notice the u in the back some guys really really love that this is these are ameriglow sights i believe so tritium front and rear we've got highlighting on the front blade that's cool i'm not a super fan of u blades you know maybe you guys are i i generally i don't know maybe i'm anal and i just like it uh to be squared off but that's just me but i shot with it and you'll see the accuracy it did fine simple markings on the side nice uh, actually dehorning job on this springfield 911 i don't see any sharp edges and since this probably could be and will be for a lot of people a pocket carry gun in the proper holster um you know it's that's probably a good thing of course no pick rail is too dang tiny squared off trigger guard that is a plus over the p238 says me although we're completely lacking in any traction here like horizontal milling they should have done this so see this the scalloping they have on the front strap back strap that's good i don't know why they didn't include carry that all the way up this is really good traction and then we have hogue g10 grip panels i think these are hogue i could be off on the brand but they're excellent high traction the black and gray ones featured here are excellent two screw attachments standard 1911 no grip safety too small ambidextrous safety so this is actually a pretty good lefty pistol at least for that you notice you don't have a slide release on the other side that's pretty standard standard position magazine release works good positive look at this portion right here a little bit of funneling going on six rounds in the flush fit magazine and this one right here i believe is a seven round with a finger rest on it stainless steel high quality i think springfield is making these yep yeah, made in usa you can't really beat a stainless steel magazine for slickness durability I learned that when I really started testing. Well, what do you know? Another uh, Springfield product, the uh, XDM. I love the XDM still to this day. And they have great magazines. They're super durable. And then we have uh, a ring hammer. Pretty standard. And then we'll talk about this trigger, which is outstanding. Oh my gosh, is this trigger good? Let's see if I have my... Uh-oh, F4 took a hit. Let me back you off, bro. That stand they have for this is dumb. How are you even supposed to put this in? I was looking at the other day. I was like, how is this supposed to go? Shouldn't it like lock in there? It's a heavy metal plane. Nope, just sits there waiting for some, the cat to knock it off. A lot of comparisons will be made on the Springfield 911 against you know who. Right, the 238 and 938. I think this has them beat. Not on that pull. Kind of a pivoting uh, trigger, and it's also made of G10, the trigger itself. I'm trying to make you look good on camera, Springfield. Help me out. 615. Wow, I, I'm really surprised it pulls that firmly because it feels like it's crisper and lighter. It really does. And again, we'll consider the 238. Uh, coming your way here in just a second the barrel is 416 stainless steel 2.7 inches in length if you care i'm not going to field strip it it's a uh, bushingless 1911 field strip with a solid guide rod look inside here i gotta tell you i've had a 938 for years and guess who absconded it from me tactical doodle you're right he took it and he carries it all the time so i haven't carried a 938 or any single action 911 carry pistol for a long long time yeah other features i talked about this already i like this it's not totally squared off but it's uh better than the 238 938 series standard slide release and i think that's it simple simple it's interesting that 
Springfield decided to come out with this to me in a marketing standpoint. I'm like, I'm curious what drove it because usually they want to make money. And I, again, like I, I mentioned, again, my dad is just a, a, a snapshot. I don't know if 380s and single action 380s specifically are selling that well, but they came out with it. So it's, I think it's good. I'm happy they did. I'm just interesting, interested to know why. But I didn't mention this 0.96 inches in thickness. And that will take us to our comparison against the P238. And this is an interesting version. This is on loan, again, from Gunnies, the Great American Gun Store. And I checked it out just for this tabletop review, actually. I did not shoot it. I'm not putting wear on it. This version of the P238. Really cool coloration, right? Spartan P238. Steel framed, actually, so it's heavier. But let's check that trigger out right here. I'm not going to pull it. Oops. And it feels great. It really does. Um, when I was shooting the 238 and the 938, I don't remember not liking the trigger. But if I compare these against each other, it seems like the 911 trigger is better. It just, just does. It's just crisper. There's not as much take up on it. It's a cleaner break. Uh, there you go, a little minor data point. So let's just quickly remind ourselves, and again, there are some variations in the 238, depending on which variation you get. We got a little rubber inset right here on the back strap. We have vertical milling on this frame type. I love this coloration, by the way, this dark Spartan bronze. It's very cool. It's thicker. The 938 is thicker than the 9... I'm sorry, the 238 is thicker than the 911 by a little bit. I've always said that thinness in your carry pistol is a very, in fact, the most important dimension, and I will stick with that. It is. This is going to be a little bit easier to carry. In the day, though, I did carry around 238s and 938s, and I didn't have a problem with them. Of course, they're, they're tiny. Tiny. The rest is very similar. The formulation is very similar. I mean, we have the Chevron slide serrations and standard ones on 911 looking, I'm sorry, the 238 looking like a SIG Classic. Smooth grip panels on this Spartan version. How about the sights? Uh, I like um, the, of course, the 938 sights are awesome. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not showing them through the viewfinder. I'd probably prefer the 938s by a very slight margin, but these ones are good. The Ameriglows are fine. I talked about the U-notch thing already. Uh, interestingly, you, you, did you see what I did earlier? And I, I did talk about this in the 238, 938 review. And this is a problem in the battery of arms. We're kind of jumping into philosophy of use. Do you carry a gun like this? Um, totally you can. But even, you know, I'm a reviewer and I, I go to pull the trigger and oh, the safety's on. And that's on a tabletop review. So it's just a little bit more added complexity. You're carrying it condition one. Whoever's carrying this gun or any gun like it, you're just going to have to train and practice, practice, practice. I'm kind of out of practice really because I don't carry them. I carry something much simpler that if I carry 380 and heck it's a competitive option, I'll roll it on the camera right now. To me, it's one of my all time favorite carry 380s and that's the Ruger LCP2. This is hot, it's loaded, and yeah, I do carry this. But we thought you hated the 380. Sometimes I do carry a 380, just sometimes. What I always say is I'm armed. Very rarely it will be a 380 only in certain clothing and certain temperatures and certain errands. It, but uh, this is a great 380 to carry. But the, the point I'm going to make here is the simplicity of an LCP2, or for that matter, a Caltech P3AT, or any gun like it. The trigger is awesome in this one, by the way, the improvements on the LCP2. Watch my review. But it's simple. It's you pull it out, pull the trigger, goes bang. This is more complex. You know, apply my discussion from 2009 on this very subject. It has not changed. Quick look at this coloration, by the way. Look how cool that is. The thing I'll ding on it is there's very low contrast, actually no contrast in these LCP2 sights. Not great. Good traction on it, and it's lighter than these guns. This thing is light. What's the load I got in here, dudes? I think golden, uh, some type of defense. I forget the name of this, but it's like a 90 grain hollow point, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. Some guys get really wrapped around the axle. About, oh, what load should I carry? You need to worry about hitting first. Carry a good quality hollow point ammunition and then train, practice, and then hit with it. The 380 is already underpowered. For that matter, so is a 9mm. So you got to hit with it. I wouldn't worry too much about load.
Not so much. I love this gun. Makes me happy. Oh, and I always carry an extra mag too. Watch my 10 biggest EDC mistakes video. That's the extended mag for the LCP too. So if it goes, I'm gonna carry it in this pocket holster. Told you I carry it that way sometimes. And I actually do it this way. Check this out. So I put a rubber band over it. So that way, if it were to fall out of my pocket, I don't have a gun without a holster tumbling wherever it is on a floor. So this is just my mileage. If I need to, I can just pull that out, snap that rubber band easy. I just came up with that. It's just a simple, cheap solution for more security and better yet, safety. There you go. So yeah, 380. Uh, but that is a more simple platform. If you're going with a Springfield 911, whoever you're buying it for, Dudes, they've got to train. And you don't have to go to the range. You can do it freaking just in front of the television. That poor pedo tube is getting snapped. Makes me sad if that breaks off. Oh, yeah. Gun review. All right. So, philosophy of use. Uh, yeah. 9mm is preferred to me. There are certain situations. Backup pistol. Short errands. You only have short. Something where concealability is paramount. Uh, for instance, I talked to a guy who's in a hospital and he wears scrubs all the time, that is an application where I could say, yeah, 380 might be your gut of choice. Something as absolutely small, thin, as compact as you can go. Uh, the, the 32 ACP is okay. Go watch my P32 review. I have a philosophy discussion there. I would prefer a 380. That would be an application I could sign off on. Backup pistol, yep, said that. You might throw in there WROL BOK pistol. That is a bug out kit pistol. A lot of you guys call them BOBs, bug out bags. Springfield Armory. Yeah, I, I still kind of go with a 22 long rifle mostly because you can carry more ammunition for the weight. Home defense, no way, dude. I don't have a way to attach a light on it. It's very small. Small pistols are extremely hard to shoot, especially single action ones. It's very easy to throw your shots. I've talked about that at length before over the years. And it's hard to shoot them well it really is because they're tiny and they're small short pou discussion and then we talk about how it shot reliability was hit and miss as we kicked off the springfield 911 i did multiple outings with it once again there were several failures on it i'm not going to lie uh, with good ammunition uh, failures the recurring problem we saw is failures to go into battery I've seen this before in some other guns, and what it is generally is a fitting problem, and the factory, if you send it back to them, they can tune it, and they can make it reliable. I've seen it with SIGs as well. I've seen it with Rugers. I had an SR9 in the day. It had the exact same problem. It failed to go in the battery. Sent it back. They tuned it up, came back, and it was fine. I think this gun could be cured that way as well. Uh, I think also I had a couple... Not stove pipes, but just weird jams. I'll have to review the video footage. We did take it up in the mountains. We did have the Gunny's crew help shoot it. Adam was there. Uh, Wyatt's kid was there shooting it. And he had several failures for it to go into battery as well. So it was a recurring problem. Then I took it apart. I lubed it. I put some Slip 2000 on the rails. Cleaned it. Uh, I think I have video of me doing that. I'll roll it in somewhere in the video and after that for me it was a hundred percent as I remember so versus this gun the p238 I would say reliability is a distant second for the SIG p238 because we had no problems with that gun whatsoever no failures to go into battery no stove pipes no jams whatsoever that I can remember same with the 938 I don't know what SIG does to those two pistols but man are they tuned they are ready to rock and roll this one, you are probably going to have to run it, and if it has problems, it's you're probably going to have to send it back and get it, again, worked on a little bit. Into the world? Nope. The cool thing is, like I said, it has a better trigger. It's a great little pistol. If you can get it 100% accurate, I'm sorry, 100% reliable with your load choice, or actually with any ammo you throw in it, then you've got yourself a shooter. Again. And, and my likability scale is going to reflect what happened out in field. I mean, if it was 100% reliable, my likability scale would go up. It would match that of the P238. Because as we go on, I'm going to show you, well, right now, the accuracy. Let me raise this up a little bit. Sound effect. What do we got back here, dudes? Oh, recon still sitting out there. Yeah, oh, this is hanging out there, too. It's kind of cool. What's that doing there? I'll show you that later. So here's the SA 911 380, 10 yards standing. So this is all standing. I do almost all my shooting standing. 90 grain hydroshock, 
Hydroshock, Mixed Loads here. Hydroshock, that's actually a formidable group. Mixed Loads there. Dang, I only got two targets. I thought I had more. Nine yards, dudes, with the P. Sorry, here I go again. Springfield, 911. I got 238 on the brain. That is a great group. Up arrow, exclamation point, Springfield, 911, 380, standing. And it was windy that day. Look at this group. That is extremely hard to do, by the way. I will say that always. That group, I'm giving a wiggle mark, but actually for a pocket pistol at nine yards standing, it's pretty good. Uh, that group right here, that group. I would classify, I had more paper, but I can't keep all these targets. I'm just getting overwhelmed. And by the way, when you order something at nothing fancy, Big Cartel, Tactical Doodle throws in those targets and usually some other freebies. Uh, we still have those cool patches. Uh, actually, they're pretty dumb. Kind of like that. Gun fancy big cartel. I know. I tell him to reorder stuff all the time. I, he's got his own mind, dude. I cannot control tactical doodle. I just like, dude, do this. I have so many cool merch ideas. I mean, he just won't do them. Oh my gosh, he's busy with his life. Rant complete. Great accuracy. I'll classify it as excellent. As far as the dynamics of shooting, muzzle flip, uh, piece of cake. I like shooting the 911, standard 380 dynamics, really easy to control for me. Now for a female shooter, a small statured shooter, you know, might be a different story. I will always say they are hard to shoot well because they're so tiny. They have a short sight radius, they bounce all around, you get it. Now we go into the last part of the video. Competitive options, would I buy it? Hmm. Do you want me to tell you what the internet wants to hear, or do you want me to tell you the truth? I always want the truth, not fancy. Okay, I wouldn't buy it. I would not buy it. Not for the reason you're thinking. You're probably going, well, it had some problems reliability-wise out in the desert, and so that's why you don't want to buy it. Mm, that's really not the reason. Like I said, I could send it back, or do it myself, tune it so it's not failing to go into battery. That's a fairly simple thing to correct in my, my experience. I'd rather go with something like this. LCP2. I mean, it's less expensive, a lot less expensive. It's lighter. To me, it's cooler looking. It's more simple. I'm going to highlight the sights. I'll LCP2. fix that. Yeah, how can you go wrong? Uh, Sig P238. Would I buy that over this gun? To me, it's a draw. I like how this is thinner. I like the little, little bit better trigger on it. I don't know. I, I don't know if I can make a decision on that. Uh, Smith & Wesson Bodyguard. I've never reviewed that. I don't think a lot of people like it. I probably ought to review it. One of these days, I might. If this gets like 50,000 views within a week, I'll review the Smith & Wesson Bodyguard. I'll pick one up. So I'll watch the views on this video closely. The Diamondback 380. You guys remember that one in the project? What a disaster. Oh my gosh. That pistol, like parts were falling off it. It wasn't uh, reliable. Yeah, I basically had to condemn it, give it a non-recommend. I don't know if Diamondback ever fixed it. I'll tell you this though, it was one of the most accurate pistols I've ever shot. The DB380 was insane. Now there was some vindication with the Diamondback FS9 that I reviewed and it was a pretty good gun. I like that one. Colt Mustangs out there if you like this form factor, check it out. Uh, Smith, Smith & Wesson came out with the MMP Shield Easy 380. Yeah, it's 19 ounces. 19 ounces, dudes? No. Uh-uh. Daddy no like. A and it's bigger than, I think, a Smith & Wesson 9mm shield in some dimensions, if I'm remembering right. Holy cow. Um, so, no, I wouldn't buy it. But at the same time, that's my mileage, mostly because of the single action take on it. Uh, I can Hey, I can carry cocked and locked and rock and roll with it. I just like simple. I just like simple. And, and when you cock and lock it, then you have like, well, hammer in the, you know, position you see right there. So it's kind of a different form factor. A lot of guys do it though. I ran into TMPers over the years, like I said, that were carrying these micro single action pistols and they absolutely love them. As far as SAWC goes, this thing is awesome. I mean, it really is fitting the pocket pistol terminology. Not quite in the palm of your hand, however. Nothing fancy review complete.